Thank you. Well, the lecture today is on the subject of experts. There's one definition. An expert is a person with a briefcase at least 50 miles away from home. The one I gave is an expert is one who knows everything about nothing, whereas a generalist knows nothing about everything. The expert tends to be so narrow that they know everything about that little small subject and nothing else. The generalist doesn't know anything. Now, I have been both an expert and a generalist. And I can tell you, the expert wins against the generalist almost always by the following devices. One, you use a lot of jargon, which the generalist doesn't know. Secondly, you invoke basic principles in your field which may be totally irrelevant, but sound good. And you snow the generalist, and you lead him astray. So most times in an argument, the generalist loses by those two methods. The specialist does not come down to the generalist level, but rather stays at his high level and leaves the generalist losing. So it's a problem you'll face. Now, you people are by and large supposed to be generalists, so we face a different problem. Now, a fellow named Kuhn wrote a famous book, Scientific Revolutions, and he looked at the si structure of scientists and the revolutions. And he gave the name paradigm to a f name a pattern of what is going on. Typically, you are taught physics. You are taught not only the formulas, but you're taught a style of thinking about it. The style is not mentioned. It's just delivered. The kind of problems you can ask, the kind of answers you get, are all implied in this style. And people, by and large, operate within the paradigm of the field. Suddenly, there may be upsets. In physics, there were two of them, relativity and quantum mechanics. Both of them provided a different framework of thinking and different kinds of questions. Relativity opened up the whole field of uh, cosmology, the origin of the universe, and so on. It really opened up the field now, so there's lots of speculation. The difficulty with cosmology is you have one sample only, and you're supposed to account for how it happened. You haven't got a bunch of different samples, and you haven't any power to experiment. So cosmology is a very interesting science if you think it's a science. Now, the contradictions will arise in the field. In the late 1800s, there were numerous contradictions. And I told you in discussing quantum mechanics how some of these led to something else. But most people in the field will ignore uh, contradictions, will dismiss them, will do anything at all but face them, and so they go on and they don't do anything. It's only by noticing their contradictions and building them up that you have a chance of making the big change. It's a very difficult thing to pay attention to what doesn't agree with what accepted doctrine is, because you are not popular if you bring up yes, but. For example, I brought up to you with regard to uh, thinking, that although we talk all the time about the neural system, uh, neurons storing knowledge here, there, and yon, yet one-celled animals can apparently learn, and they don't have a nervous system. Well, by and large, that is totally ignored it may or may not be relevant, but I keep it in mind saying, well, you know, maybe what I'm being told is not the complete story. Most people in the field ignore the fact and go on thinking within their framework that the nervous system explains everything. Now, when a change occurs, it's resisted by almost everybody in the business. I can find no figures reliably of how much relativity and how much quantum mechanics was resisted. I can tell you that in uh, late 1930s, I saw in the library at the University of Nebraska quite a few books trying to claim that Euclid was a true geometry and all of the things were all wrong and consequently relativity was wrong. There was a lot of relativity books written against relativity. So it indicates quite a few people did not accept relativity. And if you go back to our boy Planck, 
about adopting quantum mechanics, there's a classic sentence of his. We didn't convert them, we outlived them. I thought about that many times. The bitterness must have been in his voice. We didn't convert them, we outlived them. That's how we won. By and large, entrenched people would not pay attention to the new ideas. This is normal process. New ideas are greatly resisted. Now, it's supposed by Kuhn that the new ideas ultimately triumph. Well, yeah, ultimately. But I told you back in 1838, Dick wrote about what amounts to continental drift. And in the early 1900s, uh, Wegener wrote a whole book. But it got nowhere. It was adopted in the 40s well after the war, or perhaps early 50s. Learned physicists wrote against why it couldn't possibly happen. Of course, they assumed the wrong model, uh, based on the wrong model, they proved continents couldn't drift. The other one I mentioned to you is uh, genetics, metals peas. He might as well not have done it. It was rediscovered in 1900, and then people found out he had done it earlier. It is not clear that a new idea will triumph. I cannot possibly tell you how many new ideas were lost and didn't triumph because there's no way of finding them. But my suspicion is that the idea that people have that ultimately truth triumphs in science may be true if the ultimate is long enough, but it may be well past your lifetime. So the idea that what we'd like to have that we really went out early is simply not correct. It's a very great resistance when you have a new idea. Now, beyond just the continental drift, because South America fitted Africa along with the strata of rocks, there was the fact that the biologists had found the same kind of remnants of animals in the rocks in Australia, in South America, and Africa. As naturally suppose, they must have been connected together because the animals were in one place. And to account for some of these things, there were a belief that land bridges came up and sank down, so the animals get across and sank again, but there was no evidence. And there was the theory biologists had of one unified land, Pangaea breaking up into Gondwana land and so on. Other geologists wanted no part of it until they finally had seen right with their own eyes practically the split in the continents and where the new land is being made right at the bottom of the oceans. And then suddenly it was accepted. When you read now and accuse them of it, oh, we always believed it, we just didn't have the final evidence. They were very, very resistant to the idea. It's one of the best ones in my lifetime of total resistance to an idea which apparently now is fairly triumphant. Most of us people believe something like uh, plate tectonics is the way the planet is built. But it could be changed tomorrow, I don't know. Now I have one that's my favorite one. A guy went to the patent office and applied for a patent that would lift water more than 33 feet. Now you read in your physics book that vacuum will lift water 33 feet, no more. They wouldn't give a patent. After all, the books say he couldn't. So he brought some equipment in and put it on top of the roof. A little valve here, a little valve up there. And a short stroke pitch piston. The piston is going so fast the standing waves are set up in the column. When there's a rarefaction, water comes in. When there's a compression, the valve shuts. And when there's a compression, the water goes out the top. He lifted the water 100 feet. They had to give him a patent. But they didn't believe it because all the books said you can't lift water more than 33 feet because the air pressure outside is so much, it's only going to push up so far. But you see, he saw ingenious ways of producing uh, rarefaction and compressions and proceeded to lift water 100 feet instead. I'm not saying it's a good method. I'm saying it's typical that the patent office knew that the books all said you can't lift water. But you see, everything like that is based upon something. 
No possibility proof rests on one statement. It rests on a whole bunch. And if any one of them is wrong, well, and they never visualized. They thought, if I simply tried to suck the water up, yes, I can only lift about 33 feet. The perfect vacuum won't lift any further. But if I produce local vacuums, then I can. So you see one of the troubles with the expert. You're proposing to do something he knows can't be done, but you may be doing it a different way and he cannot hear, or she cannot hear. It's a very, very great troublesome thing. Now, I said the geologists claimed everything was right, and, uh, huh. well, they had to revise themselves. Now, there's a well-known saying, if an expert tells you something can be done, it is probable it can be done. If he tells it can't be done, it may pay to get another expert who may tell you you can. Certainly my experience at Bell Laboratories has been the experts have been marvelously wrong lots of times. They don't understand the problem. I had a young fellow working for me for a while, bright, energetic, nice guy, but he didn't understand. He missed, saw, he grabbed the wrong problem, distorted the wrong way, solved it very elegantly. As a result, his work had to be undone before he could get to the right problem. The misidentification of a problem is very great. The expert sees some parts of it. See, oh yes, this looks right, that looks right, oh yes, that's nothing else than this. They force the situation into a situation they know, or think they know, and then look at it that way from their trained eyes, and they don't see the problem, has got some elements which are different. The experts simply cannot see it. It's the same words I told you earlier in this lecture, that they can't remember there are small contradictions in any theory. They conveniently forget them. Well, this guy was very nice, but I found frequently he was a nuisance. What he said was correct, but he had the wrong problem. He had the right answer to the wrong problem. And trying to find the, a reasonably good answer to the right problem is something very difficult to do when the guy is giving the exact answer to the wrong problem. It's very hard to undo that. But that's one of the things they do. Now, Kuhn and historians of science have concentrated on the big changes in science. It's my impression that the smaller changes in science work the same. There are many small changes that occur in science, and they don't get adopted frequently. For example, one that I didn't succeed with. Working at Bell Telephone Laboratories, it was natural that I would meet the frequency approach. You remember in servo mechanisms, you analyze by frequencies. You imagine in transmission, you worried about the frequency bandwidth and so on. Now, I told you earlier that I had tried to do what I observed happened for Max Planck. I tried to use the right formulas so that my calculation would fit with their beliefs in their field, not just approximate with polynomials, which is traditional. So I gradually developed a technique of approximating not by polynomials, but by frequencies, sines and cosines or complex exponentials. And you know how powerful Fourier series really is since you're more or less electrical engineers. Well, my friends in computing kidded me about it. They never listened. They never adopted it. And they, nothing to do. They just never did. In fact, I wrote a book which is reasonably well expounded. But most numerical analysis books now will mention the fast Fourier transform, and that's all I'll ever say about the frequency approach. Yet, by calculating that way on several occasions, because the calculation in terms of frequency, the person for whom I produced the numbers could understand the numbers better than they could if it were polynomial. If I say, well, I passed so many frequencies instead of I used a polynomial degree 5. Polynomial degree 5 wouldn't mean anything. These were the frequencies we passed through that he could understand. Frequently, not always. So I led some people to small things, not as great as quantum mechanics, but to small help by trying to adjust the computation to fit the person's beliefs. Now, there's other ones. I also occasionally use real exponentials for some things. And some other fields, sometimes, and talking to a person over lunch, I found out the kind of functions they believed in. I tried to use those kinds of functions to help them find insight. Well, I didn't succeed there as an episode where I think to this day that I'm right, but uh, that idea yet not percolated into computing although it's widely used by physicists. 
Now, I'm not bringing up these troubles uh, just to poke fun at things, but for four reasons why I bring up the role of expert. First, as you go on, you'll have to deal with experts, and you ought to know the faults and good parts of experts. They know a lot. Secondly, many of you will become an expert, and I'm hoping somehow or other that you won't be as bad as the average expert. Third, it appears to me the rate of progress is increasing and will continue to increase in your period. Therefore, there will be more need for you to adjust to new things, and more often the experts will be wrong because the situation isn't like it was yesterday. Fourth, if only I could say the right things to you, I would make you stay ahead and not let you become obsolete. That is a very sensitive point for me. I have had several of my friends, good friends, left behind because they didn't adopt new things. I told you roughly about a friend of mine who was a great analog person. I learned a great deal from him, but he wouldn't really convert to digital, and he was left behind. And we retired at the same time. Him, by encouraged retirement with a little extra money, and me to go on to a different job. Later on when we met, it was clear that our attitudes toward our life careers at Bell Labs were quite different. Mine was pleasant, his was unpleasant, because he was sort of pushed out. Since coming here, I've met quite a few captains in the Navy who retired. They didn't make Admiral. Some of them were reasonably happy what happened to them, but some of them show a good deal of being disgruntled and unhappy. Particularly one who, when you get him drunk enough, he's always back in command of a flotilla off South America. He didn't like being passed over several times and retired. My problem is, how do I get you people to rise to as far as you wish to, rather than being pushed out? One way is to try and get you open to new ideas and accept new things rather than cling to the old. My friend got pushed out because he clung to the old. He wouldn't learn digital computing. Now, I got to bring up another very difficult subject. Most of the time, the bright new idea comes from without the field, not within. Take archaeology, and the question of dating remains. The traditional method was to look at how many layers of dirt there were above it and estimate how much the river flowed then and so on, what kind of stones were there, and estimate how many years passed to bury it that many levels deep. Carbon dating was proposed by a physicist. And it was opposed to a great extent by the archaeologists. Nevertheless, you know carbon dating has come in quite well now and is by basic a tool, along with dozens of variations of carbon dating, to find out how old things are, probably. But the idea came from without, not within. You take Einstein. When he graduated with a PhD, he could not find a job in any university. Ultimately, after trying some other things, he ended up in the patent department in Switzerland. He'd been working there quite a few years when he published the five great papers in one year. He was an outsider. Now, it's true that once he published those things, it wasn't long, a year or so, before beginning a job offer. So within five years, there he was at the prestigious uh, Berlin Institute, which is the top of the line. And when the Nazis came along, he ended up at the Institute for Advanced Study. But he was an outsider when he did it. As far as I know, in the telephone companies, the same thing is true. They had already calculated. Remember back in the hand operator days, which you probably don't know, there was a lady who did everything out there, nice lady. You, she said, number please. You told her what you wanted, and she connected you up. They were generally unmarried young ladies. And they had already calculated that if they were to continue the expansion as they would, they would be employing all the unmarried girls in the population to be operators. You think they'd do something about it? No. As far as I can make out, it was an undertaker in Cincinnati who felt that he was not getting fair treatment. Because in those days, when your spouse died, you could call the undertaker, uh, telephone operator and say, I need an undertaker. And she had a long list, but she marked him off and gave you next one. Well, he thought he was not being treated fairly. He said, by God, if I build a mechanical switch, I will be bound to get fairness. So he built a mechanical central office instead of a human-operated one. 
It didn't come from within. Bell Labs didn't produce it, if I'm correct in the stories I've read. It was somebody outside the system. Transistors wasn't invented by vacuum tube experts. It was done by somebody else. Again and again, the next step forward is done by somebody not in the field. Now that presents you with a terrible dilemma. Outside your field of expertise, there are a mass of kooks, crazy people, with crazy ideas. Almost all of them are crazy. If there is a new step forward, it's probably one of those guys outside the field. The big new step forward in your field is likely to come from outside. Outside, there's a horde of crazy guys with crazy ideas. What is your strategy? Difficult. If you listen to all those kooks, you'll get nothing done. If you ignore them all, you won't be part of the big step forward. What do you want to do? There is no easy answer. If you very much want to be connected with the next big step forward, then you listen to more kooks than you would if you were willing to pass them up and simply continue to do first class work, but not the great new step forward. But it's the same is true in all fields. I'll repeat the situation. There's a tremendous number of crazy people out there who don't understand, don't know anything, but have got all kinds of crazy ideas. You can spend all your time trying to help them, and they will absorb all your time. They can absorb it. They can write letters to you endlessly. You write a letter back, trying to turn them off, you get another long letter back. It's almost impossible to you write, look, I'm not going to read more letters from you and throw it out. I have the same trouble now. I worked with a guy at Bell Labs for years. Very nice guy. Well, he's now somewhat kooky. I get letters and phone calls from him periodically to this date. He just can't understand that I'm interested in other things now. He's wrapped up in his thing, and because I was once interested in things that he was interested in then, because uh, I was working with him, uh, doesn't mean I now am. But he keeps on wasting his time phoning me or sending me letters or this and that, and it doesn't do any good because I decided I am not interested in the things he's interested in. I'll just go along without. On the other hand, I know he had lots of original new ideas. I just can't keep up, so I've had to quit. But it's a very great problem. The great ideas are going to come from without the field, not within. Now, I've covered two main problems dealing with experts. The expert is certain that they are right, and they do not consider the basis of their beliefs. They don't understand, as that example, what's wrong. But there's a third thing which is worse. It's insidious that I met at Bell Laboratories in, with regard to computing. And let me draw a picture which is the best thing I could do. This is time, and this is progress as a curve. Now remember, it's a curve in n-dimensional space. Not in two, it's n-dimensional. Here's my boss, and that's what he did to be successful. 19, let's say 35, do 45, we'll say, surround in that region. Here's this guy hamming, marching in that direction. He's damn near orthogonal to his boss. Now his boss knows how to do things because his boss succeeded. That's how to do it, by God. That's what made me successful. By God, those are the methods to use. This guy Hammy is crazy. He hasn't got it right. That's the third thing wrong with experts. What made you successful and got you to the top is very likely to be irrelevant or wrong when you're there. The world has changed. Computers came in. Computing here for him was something some high school girls with desk calculators did when you couldn't get a nice formula or they evaluated formula, they drew a graph. Computing was something high school girls did. There were four groups of Bell Labs when I arrived doing exactly that kind of work. This crazy guy in Hamming is using big machines, a lot of expense. And that isn't the way you do things. Come on, you do it by complex variable. You do it by honest to God mathematics, not by computing. 
Now, that was never said. If I had accused him directly of this, you are biased this way and this is paying attention, they would have denied they were biased against computing. But it was there just the same. And I met it many, many times. They would show me some problem which they had solved elegantly by analytic methods and say, can you do it? Well, given the machines I had at the time, the answer was no. But I would say, look, I am not in the slightest interest in doing problems that you can do. What I'm interested in using machines for is solving the problems you can't do. The real problem is what can man and machine do together and not in competition? No way could they hear that. I must have said it 50 times or 100 times. I'm not interested in the competition. I'm interested in what we can do together. They could only see it because they were down at the bottom. They were afraid this guy with his dumb machines was going and it was doing problems they couldn't do. And they were afraid they were going to be displaced. So I had a great deal of opposition. This is one thing wrong with experts also. They don't come out and say why you're wrong. It's in the atmosphere that you're wrong. You're doing things wrong. Now, when you're an expert, you'll do the same thing unless I get this picture across to you very, very clearly. Remember, it's in n dimensions, not just two. Progress is going to be some kind of a curve. What you do to make yourself successful at that time may very well be not only not appropriate, may actually be counterproductive to what is needed when you're successful. Remember it. Now, I have followed my own advice. I've recognized that the things I did to be successful in computing aren't the things you want to do. For example, saving a few operations meant something when an operation took one second. But when an operation takes a nanosecond, you can't make much of a living saving nanoseconds. They just aren't going to pay you much. Well, I've got the wrong slant in things. As a result, knowing the story I've just told you, I resolved if and when I rose to the top, I would not try and impose my ideas on other people. Thus, I have avoided getting involved in the selection of computers. I've avoided doing everything else. If asked, I am compelled to respond with the best answers I can give. But I try not to get in the way of the next generation. I've tried very, very hard to do that. And I suggest you think the same thing, that the next generation has a different problem. They see the world differently because the world has changed. And your views, which are fixed when you're young, and the very things I say that made you successful are inappropriate later on, very frequently. Not always, but very frequently. And since uh, many industries are going to change enormously toward mechanization, the old ideas of treatment of human beings may not be the same as it was when the organization was mainly humans. The more automated it gets, the more things are going to have to be done somewhat differently. Now, another example of the same thing is Einstein. Einstein, with his photoelectric effect, got quantum mechanics going. You all know his opposition to quantum mechanics was famous saying, the good Lord doesn't play with dice. He didn't believe there's randomness. Now, the physicists, when you press them, want to believe their tin god Einstein was still a help. And they will give you all kinds of arguments how helpful he was with his opposition and so on. But you come right down to it. If he'd only kept his mouth shut and let him alone, quantum mechanics would have got along a lot faster. But he was constantly opposing. But they, the physicists would say, well, the opposition made him sharpen up their ideas and so on. It also gave him a great deal of needless trouble. The man who started quantum mechanics, uh, as real Planck got it started, but really didn't start until Einstein gave it a shot in the arm with a photoelectric effect. He was opposed to it. And it comes down to the story, which I think I told you before, about myself. When a friend of mine said to another friend, I don't think Hamming understands error correcting codes, and the second friend repeated to me over a phone, I was just about to say, why that little twerp? And instead of that, I said, yes, he's probably right. History shows that the people who create an idea seldom understand it. I've told you that before. I'm telling it to you again. It's very, very true. As they say about Newton, he was not the first of the moderns. He was the last of the ancients. And if you read the life of Newton, you see the truth of that sentence. 
He opened the door to modern times. But he wasn't one of the moderns. He is very definitely thinking in earlier ways. And it's bound to be happening. The person who creates a new idea, after a while, pay no attention to him. He's probably wrong. Or if you've done it, step aside and let the other people do it. Now, the reason why I'm so interested in this matter of getting you on this topic of experts is that I told you earlier in this lecture, I am perturbed by the number of people who are left behind. Now, I can tell you a couple of stories. When I discussed software, I mentioned the number of people who would not pass from absolute binary to symbolic codes, the number of people who would not learn Fortran and so on. What happened to them? They disappeared. They dropped out of the field. Now, years and years ago, IBM used to give uh, seminars, uh, invite you for a week to Poughkeepsie or Endicott at their homestead, and we have a week spent discussing computers. And they always took a picture, a class picture, and you got a picture with all the names out and so on, and I took them home. One day, many, many years later, I saw one of those pictures, and I said, oh boy, I'm going to see all the leaders of computing. Well, there was von Neumann. There I was too for but about half the people, yes, I could dimly remember them, but I hadn't heard of them for years. They had disappeared. They had not kept up. Life is full of change. Keeping up is one of the major problems. And the trouble of the expert, when he becomes an expert, he freezes his knowledge at that state and does not go on. I am very concerned that I can get you people to be receptive to change, to recognize that when you know something, You'd better reconsider it. Is it still appropriate today? And I told you that miserable story uh, about the fast Fourier transform. Why it is not the Tukey Hamming, but the Tukey Cooley? Because Hamming was stupid. He didn't realize that he had a different machine. When he figured out it couldn't be done, he figured out in terms of the computing machine he had. When he had another computing machine, he didn't stop and rethink. He just repeated what he said before. Now nah, that won't work. I tried it once and it didn't work. Yeah, I tried it once. It didn't work, given the machines I had. Given the machines I then had in my hands, it would have worked. I didn't do it. It's a real bubble. But I've seen that not only that time myself, but I've seen it in other people also. The inability to move forward, to grasp new ideas and open your mind to new things. Now, be careful. An open mind and a hole in the head are sometimes indistinguishable. I don't mean that you should say, oh, I got an open mind, anything is possible. There are a lot of those people around who say, oh, anything is possible. Yeah, but you can't go on that. For example, some of the people, anything is possible business, maintain that when you got to the moon, there'd be 20 feet of dust, and the vehicle would simply sink in the dust and drop out of communication. The other ones who claim, you know, the thing had been hit by so many meteorites, it's all glassy, it'll simply slide around everything, it's glass surface due to all the striking, the heating, and the cooling. Well, both were possible, yes. You couldn't prove they weren't. But you know, we found the surface of the moon pretty much like the surface of the Earth. Pretty much the same. Slightly different chemicals, but pretty much the same stuff. Keeping an open mind everything is possible is not satisfactory. You have to put some probabilities to it, and those are hard. But if you don't put some probabilities, oh, that's possible, you won't get very far with me. I always say, well, what do you think? 10%, 50%, 90%? What probability do you put with this? Possibly it's this. I think I mentioned, no, I guess didn't in this lecture. I haven't mentioned yet that I've met a bunch of Navy captains. Have I told you that? Yes, I did. I thought, I thought it got out of place there somewhere. Well, yes. Now, I've used a lot of isolated stories here in these lectures. They illustrate situations. I could produce dozens of other stories illustrating the same point. These are not perfect knowledge because there are some stories which would contradict what I said. There are some people who stuck to the principles and turned out to be right anyhow. That sometimes the experts are right and the people with new ideas are wrong. But by and large, it seems to me, viewing my experience in science in general and Bell Labs in particular, the opposition to new ideas was enormous. 
error correcting codes, for example, obviously are good. Not only will they get you the right answer, but as I told you, they will enable you to maintain the equipment. The first use at Bell Labs in a Bell system was about 10 years later. And it was in a desperate situation. They were trying to make electronic central offices, and they were going to have a great big plate, photographic plate, with all the information stored on it, because there were no good storage devices in those days. There were no cheap ones they needed. All the phone numbers, everything else there. So they were going to make a new photographic plate. And they were going to have a small auxiliary memory down here, which would contain a few updating of telephone numbers, which were changed. Somebody pointed out to them, you know, nobody can make a photographic plate that big without occasional flaw here or there. Well, if one in 10,000 phone calls are misdirected, who cares? But if it's always the same time for one month, it's always the same guy who's getting it, that is not tolerable. Not by the telephone company. They had to do something. The only thing they could do was to put an error correcting codes on the plate. So if a flaw occurred here, there, and yon, they could correct it and go ahead. It took 10 years before the idea got into motion and had a real widespread use. Meanwhile, there was endless opposition on the grounds, well, I always send error detecting if it's wrong, call for a second message. Yes, but that requires two-way two transmission and other things, whereas feed forward, which is error, what error correction is, you know what feedback circuits are. Error correction is feed forward. I feed the message, and I feed the correction stuff with it. So you have all the stuff to correct at the right end. It's evidently something different, something very useful. But a forward-looking organization took 10 years before they were willing to do it, and then only in desperation. There was nothing else they could do, so they finally tried it. So I'm somewhat dismal about how rapidly new ideas get in. I told you one about frequency approach, they never got in. A bunch of other ones, some got in rapidly, some got slowly. Uh, it varied. The more radical the idea is, the longer it takes to get absorbed. The more opposition you'll get. Now, one of the reasons why these things happen is you. You, as far as I'm concerned, were designed over a million years or so of primitive living to cope with civilization, or cope with life. You don't work well in big groups. You work well in small groups. There's a distrust for the outsider built into you. There is, I told you, in jargon, jargon is designed to keep the outsider out. There's all kinds of things in you which were designed for the small clan, the small in-group, your own department. And in fact, I've seen at Bell Labs department, two departments trying to do each other harm really, in Bell Labs, instead of trying to cooperate. They both wanted to win, and so they did things which would cause the other guy trouble. In fact, I can tell you one story which is almost unbelievable, but it was true. One of my bosses at one time, years ago, when they were first trying to build electronic central offices, he was asked to find out what do the mechanical offices do. Now, you can look at the blueprints, but that really doesn't tell you everything. You have to be familiar with it. So he was asked to go over and get from a group how central offices work. Well, the big boss at the top assigned it. They couldn't not take them in. But he told me they would do anything they could to sabotage the thing, to get him to have the wrong idea so electronic guys would build electronic central office wrong so it wouldn't match with older central offices so there'd be trouble. They literally tried to lead him astray as best they could without flagrantly lying. They just suppressed and everything else. He indicated sometimes they'd read out and lie, but we'll say they're better than that. They just didn't tell the truth. He spent several years trying to find out, and he finally found out. I will ask him that question, and in answering that, I'll find the answer to the question over here. But if I ask him that, they won't tell me. But if I ask him that, they'll be careless, and I'll find the answer to that question. That's how he had to spend something a year and a half or two years of his life trying to extract from one group of people how a central office really ran so we could build electronic ones to go with it. Now, that kind of thing happens in the military as too, you know. The squabbling of the various branches, they will sabotage each other. Well, 
you were created, I say, during caveman days with a distrust for the outsider and loyalty to your group. A suitable for caveman days is not suitable for the future. The future includes very much larger cooperation. It includes whole laboratories like Bell Labs. We can't afford this internal squabbling that I saw so often in Bell Labs. And I regard Bell Labs as being very high class. I imagine, but I have no proof, that more squabbling goes on in other places. I have certainly have seen uh, dirty work in software, not telling the other guy quite what the program did to cause them trouble. I have seen personalities get in the way. Well, civilizations of veneer on top of your caveman instincts. And one of the features of civilization is instead of acting on your immediate instincts, you stop and think, should I be doing this? Rather than just instinctively doing it. This will stop a great deal of this internal squabbling and lack of cooperation, but it will take your part actively and regularly stopping and thinking, is this the way I should be behaving? I have loyalty to the organization as a whole, and I don't have loyalty solely to the local group, the local department, the local organization. You see it all the time. AT&T had the trouble with the operating companies trying to keep them cooperative. And I occasionally had to do some work trying to keep Southern Bell and Illinois Bell working together instead of working in competition one with the other. It's a common thing. It's a natural thing. It's an instinct which you have. And for the reason why I'm mentioning it is that this is a problem you will face. And when you find these competitions going on, and if you look closely, deliberate sabotaging of each other, you have to understand that it's instinct that they're working on. This is the natural thing human beings do. You have loyalty to a local group, but you don't have loyalty to the large as much. And that's what produces it. And it's a terrible thing, but it's one of the things experts do. Experts are a small group. They will defend their own territory against any new ideas. They're opposed to new ideas because it's not part of the group. And the guy from the outside has the new idea most of the time. Most of the time, the really big advances, you can go through history if you want, most of the ideas come from outside the field, not by an expert in the field. Well, I'm supposed to make you people into great people, which means you're going to be the people who bring new ideas in and get them adopted. My speech should have told you a great deal about the problem you face. And I talked the other day about abandoning problems. On quite a few times at Bell Laboratories, when I tried to bring a new idea, particularly in chemistry, I had two good ideas in chemistry. I abandoned them. The opposition to the chemistry group was too high. I went off and did something else. There are times when it's not worth fighting for a good new idea in a group when they are too much opposed to it because you just can't win. I tried it once on executives and gave up there because they weren't prepared. I wanted to use computers to help make executive decisions. I think I told you this. What I wanted was a good first class executive for say three days a week for several years so we could find out what they did so we could help them. Instead of us sitting imagining what they should be doing. <laughs> if I'd written what I imagined they should have been doing, it wouldn't have worked. I would never have believed when I began at that age that the bulk of what top executives did at Bell Laboratories was two things, budget and personal squabbles. It wasn't scientific decisions at all. They did make some, but the bulk of their time went on miserable things like money and people. And I think you'll find the same thing as you rise to the top. Those are the things that dominate the top jobs. It's unfortunate, but it's true. People are people. And opposition to new ideas, it's opposition to new ideas, so I've given you that. The next lecture tomorrow is on a lovely subject of, I think, inaccurate data, if I'm correct. Unreliable data. That's another topic which you really don't want to hear, but you should. That no data is any good. So see you tomorrow.